my name is Monica LaFleur. I'm the program coordinator for Defenders California Field Office. So since we're painting and learning about sea otters tonight, um, it, we thought it would only make sense to have this um, event be a collaboration between our Alaska and our Northwest program since those are all included in the range of the sea otter. So I'm joined tonight by Jen Christofferson, who is the outreach coordinator up in our Alaska office. And I'm joined also by Myri Poisson. She's going to get on here in a second. She's just um, helping people join through the Zoom. Um, but Myri is the Northwest program coordinator. Um, so all of us are here planning this event for you tonight. So if you've attended past Def uh, Defenders Paint Nights, you probably remember Jen. Tonight she's given me the opportunity to be the host and she's gonna support our artist, Carrie, who we'll introduce in just a moment. We're also joined by Alaska representative, Katie Nalvin, um, who will be giving a presentation about sea otters during our paint drying break. So a couple of Zoom reminders for the evening are to keep yourself on mute and instead opt for the chat or raise hand function if you have a question or comment. We'll be monitoring that chat throughout. Um, so please feel free to just send us one if you need anything or if you have any questions. Um, so you're welcome to keep your video on or off throughout the event. Either one is good, although at the end, we are gonna ask everyone to turn on their cameras so that if you're comfortable with it, so that we can get a group photo of everyone with their paintings. Um, so right now, why don't you take a second to open up the chat. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, you can look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, and you can hit the chat button. And it would be awesome to see where everybody's joining from. So go ahead and type where you're at and your name um, so we can just see where everybody's at tonight since we have a big old um, collaborative tonight event tonight. Great, I see some California, see where Alaska, up in Washington. So cool to see so many people from all up and down the West Coast. I see a couple people might be joining from the um, theater uh, symposium today. So welcome to you all as well. A couple people out in Minnesota, that's great. Cool, so thanks everybody. Feel free to keep sending those in the chat. I think it's really cool to see where everybody's at. So we're gonna keep going, but feel free to keep sending those. So for those who might be unfamiliar with Defenders of Wildlife, I'll just give a brief introduction of who we are and then we'll get started on the painting. So Defenders is a national organization headquartered in Washington, DC, and we have six field offices that are scattered around the US. Uh, the offices represented here tonight are located in Anchorage, Alaska on the traditional lands of the Dena Ina people. We also have our Washington office, which is up in Seattle on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people, and also Sacramento, California, which is the traditional land of the Maidu, Miwok, and Mowok people. Defenders was founded in 1947 with the intention to protect and restore imperiled species populations. Since then, we've expanded our efforts across the entire US um, and we protect species by transforming policies and institutions and conducting innovative field work. But you'll definitely hear a bit more about Defenders later on once Katie gives her paint drying talk. So now we'll get started with the main event. Our artist this evening is Carrie Becker, who is based out of Eagle River, Alaska. Her style was developed with influences in realism, post-impressionism and Hellenistic. She was trained in the fine arts from Brigham Young University in Idaho and graduated with a degree in integrated studio that focuses on in-depth studio work with an emphasis on crossing conceptual and media boundaries. Finding the textures, movements, and shapes in nature is Carrie's true passion and inspiration. So Carrie's gonna walk us through our first painting steps then during our background drying time, Katie Nalvin will share information with us about sea otters across their range and let you know how you can support this important coastal species. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carrie and Jen. Hey guys, this is Carrie. So glad you guys could join us to help bring awareness to sea otters. So we're gonna start off with a little tip um, before you start painting and before you tip, uh, dip your brush into the water, um, 
by adding water first to your brushes, you'll keep this part of the brush more clear and it'll be easier for yourself to clean. So we're gonna start off with a wet brush. We're gonna add our blue to the palette. And we're gonna add some green to the palette. I'll bring up that nice and close to the screen for you in just a sec. And a little bit of white to the palette. All right, so that's kind of what I'm looking at so far. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's okay, perfect. All right, so we're gonna start off with mixing our blue with our white on our palette. Kind of want a dark, darker light, darker, the, 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 we want to lighten up that dark blue a little bit and add in a little bit of our green. All right, so that's kind of the color we're looking for. It's not screen perfect, okay. All right, so when we're painting the canvas, I am going to be working in small X's or actually kind of large X's, okay? And what this does is it gets um, into the waffle pattern. It's gonna get it in sideways, kind of like you're painting it. Just think about it when you're putting on peanut butter onto a waffle. You're just gonna do X's. We're just gonna cover the whole canvas like this in that motion. And as we bring it down further, we're gonna add more blue of the dark blue into the mix as we get down lower, okay? And we, so- We just had one comment sure. to just slow down a little. I think people are probably just getting- Okay, their getting the situated. stuff ready. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so. Not a problem, <laughs> we can pause for a sec. We do have a lot of people on tonight, so it will be, uh, we will have to, keep it going quick, kind of at a quick pace, but we will be conscious of time and stuff. So yeah, if we are going too fast, let us know, but we do, we will have to keep it going at some point too. So, so I got my dark blue mixed with a little bit of my white. So the lighter color is gonna go up top and just mix in more dark colors as you get towards the bottom is the goal. And that gives us that C effect. I'm working with sage green personally. You could use any kind of green. Every ocean is a little different, so you'll be you'll be doing just fine if it's blue. Bluish greenish will be fine. So that's my first light, lightish green area. I'm gonna go a little bit darker on my next section. And then I'm gonna go pretty much all my dark blue with just a hint of that green in there for my last. We're getting another slow down. Okay. So no worries, like she's gonna be painting the background and, and then I'll pause. Yeah, she'll pause. And you'll also have a little bit of a drying time to catch up to if you don't if you don't have a biggest brush as she does. That's the other issue. That is that very true. <laughs> I like my brushes big. I like big brushes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I have the X patterns in there, just so you I heard know. that singing. <laughs> You're having a hard time seeing? No, I heard her singing. I like big brushes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> this is why we use Carrie. <laughs> She's also the artist and comic relief. <laughs> well, they functional. I can say that because she's my friend. <laughs> You can also say dunce, that works too. Oh no. <laughs> All right. And then as we have those X brush, those X marks in our um, paint pattern, we're gonna go lightly over, once we've kind of brushed off our brush, lightly over, just go 
from one side of the canvas and completely off the other, just to give it some nice straight lines across it. <laughs> Someone's like, I like big brushes and I cannot lie. Yeah. You want the best, can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. These are our tunes for tonight. So I'm the beatboxer. <laughs> All right. So I'll let you guys catch up to that point. Darkest towards the bottom, working up to light. Or sorry, light working your way down to dark. Apologize. And just lightly brush across the top to blend it all. If you find you're fidgeting with it too much, just stop. It's okay. <laughs> we'll come back and we'll give you guys like five minutes real quick to finish that up, okay? So this is being recorded, so we will be able to share this out on social media and stuff. So if you get behind, you'll be able to watch the replay and pause and you can watch Carrie as long as you want. <laughs> Only recommended in less than 24 hours times. <laughs> Sections. Otherwise, it's too much Carrie. <laughs> Scrap terry cloth towels. Um, one too many times I used my mom's towels as a kid. I've <laughs> learned to buy my own towels. You get them in like the car detailing section. They're real cheap. You get a big pack of them. It's better than using paper towels on <laughs> earth. So yeah. <laughs> keep some microplastics in the towel instead of going down the drain. So And you don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's very true. <laughs> You don't have to clean off your palette. I just have a small, tiny travel palette. So I need to make room for the browns and stuff that we're gonna be painting with later, so. <laughs> but if you if you get to this point, you can clean off your palette and let it dry and we'll let it go. All right. Yeah, drying time. Yep. So uh, what kind of blue do you like? That's one more question we had, Carrie, before we go to Katie's part on otters. Right. I like ultramarine blue or phthalo blue personally. Phthalo is kind of my favorite color right now. So I paint a lot with phthalo blue. <laughs> phthalo? Phthalo. Yeah, phthalo. it's PH instead of TH. Oh, PH. So it's, yeah. it likes to be tricky with the vowels. Okay, everyone. I hope that they're looking beautiful so far. I feel like there wasn't too much to mess up at this point. Um, so hopefully it's going well for you all. We're going to go ahead and get started on our dry time talk with Alaska representative Katie Nalvin. Um, oh, there's our, there's our finished product in case anybody wants some inspiration. It's very cute. Um, so now that you have an idea of what we're working for, we're going to learn about these lovely furry creatures a little bit. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Katie to chat a little bit with us about sea otters. Hey there, everybody. Um, I'm just going to get my screen share going here. One moment. All right. Um, somebody let me know if you can see my screen okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, hi there. Hi, everybody. I hope you're having fun. I don't know about you all, but I definitely cannot paint and keep my hands clean. So I currently have blue hands. But uh, yeah, I hope I hope you're having a good time. Uh, so my name is Katie Bear Nalvin, and I'm the Alaska Marine Representative for Defenders of Wildlife. Tonight, while our paint dries, I'm gonna tell you, do kind of like a brief sea otter 101 and tell you a little bit about our sea otter conservation work here at Defenders. So as we said at the beginning, I, for those who aren't in, um, that familiar with Defenders, we are a national wildlife conservation org, uh, organization dedicated to the protection and restoration of imperiled species and their habitats. Um, 
We protect and restore imperiled species throughout North America by transforming policies and institutions through the promotion of innovative ideas and solutions. We speak with one voice and we prioritize science, scientific um, studies, legal advice, and policy expertise to lead effective advocacy. And we're advocating for lots of wildlife, not just sea otters, but we do so by promoting coexistence, defending conservation laws. Um, we have a Center for in Conservation Innovation. We're working on combating climate change, fighting invasive species. And additionally, our staff, um, like all of us here on the call, are very committed to being as inclusive and equitable as possible in our work to protect wildlife and wild places. So we do have six field offices throughout the country, as well as our headquarters in Washington, DC. This map shows you where we are and where our offices are. And typically we work within our field offices within just our specific regions, but for our sea otter work, our West Coast staff has sort of banded together to work on sea, otter, sea otters throughout the US portion of the sea otter historical range that I'll show you in just a second. Uh, my fabulous co-workers are Shristi in our Northwest office and Andy in the California office. And together we collaborate on all of our Defenders of Wildlife Sea Otter work. You know, sea otters, they, they don't recognize state boundaries. So we decided we shouldn't either when working together to conserve this very um, important species. And that only made sense to just achieve the greatest conservation impacts, especially to apply lessons learned from other regions to advance modern day sea otter protections and reintroductions. So this is the sea otter historical range where they, where they have been historically and where they are now. And as I mentioned, we work throughout that historical range in Alaska into the Pacific Northwest and California. But really the Sea Otter historical range is the entire specific rim. So before the fur trade, when sea hunters were hunted to near extinction, sea otters ranged all the way from Japan all the way down to Baja, Mexico. So in this graph, in this chart, the um, historical range is the blue plus the gold, so that entire line. And the areas that are just blue are where there are currently no sea otters. So you can see that um, especially true in parts of British Columbia um, and down through the US West Coast into Oregon and parts of uh, California and parts of Washington as well. Um, so uh, we also consider there to be two subspecies of sea otters that I'd like to point out why we have this map up. So we have the northern sea otter and the southern sea otter. So you can see that the sea otters, they, they have repopulated much of their historical range, but not all of it, so, um, like I mentioned, throughout the U.S. Uh, down the west coast. and. It's also important to note that where sea otters exist today are largely due to reintroduction efforts, which we'll talk about more throughout this presentation. But even places where they have not made a comeback, like some parts of um, the US West Coast, um, their story is a little, it's a little bit complicated to learn all of these very different coexistence issues that sea otters are facing. And we will, like I said, continue to talk about what that means throughout this presentation. So first off, uh, for those of you who maybe don't have sea otters in your state, we should probably talk a little bit about them. Um, so sea otters are marine mammals and are uh, the marine members of the, the family that actually includes wolverines, badgers, river otters, skunks, martens, weasels, and uh, all of our sort of the weasel family. Uh, like I mentioned, there are two subspecies, the northern and the southern, and both of those species occupy estuaries and near shore environments. And, I, and all those sea otters are marine mammals. They are different than most marine mammals like seals, sea lions, whales, dolphins, in the sense that because 
sea otters don't actually have blubber like the whales and dolphins and sea lions do. So sea otters have to have other ways, other adaptations of keeping warm in the cold ocean, such as having incredibly dense fur and they also have really, really big appetites. So actually speaking of their fur, if you go like this with your, with your thumb and uh, pointer finger, make an okay sign, that's about a square inch. And a sea otter would have about a million hairs in that square inch. So if you put that on your own head, you only have about a thousand. So the sea otter fur is incredibly dense. It's ridiculously soft. And that's one of the ways that they keep warm. Um, another way that they keep warm is their metabolism. Um, like I said, they have big, big appetites. Uh, they actually need to eat about 25% of their body weight every single day. So, you know, if you weigh like 100 pounds, if you're 100 pounds, you'd be eating like 25 quarter pound hamburgers every day if you, if you had the appetite of a sea otter. Um, so they, they eat a lot and a lot of what they eat are things um, that they can find in that near shore environment, like clams, um, urchins, um, even some octopus. Sometimes we see them eat octopus, um, crabs. I actually used to work at an aquarium and we had sea otters and it would cost, we had three sea otters and it would cost about $20,000 a year just to feed one sea otter. Um, so like I said, big, big appetites. Um, and lots of people tend to be pretty familiar with river otters. Um, so comparatively, sea otters are actually much larger. They weigh anywhere from about 35 to 40 pounds to give you some perspective. So why, why bother with sea otters? Uh, you know, aside from being super, super cute, they are keystones of a healthy marine ecosystem. So they are really, really critical to a healthy environment. So when I say keystone species, what that means is that relative to how many sea otters there are in one area, they have an incredibly large effect on the ecosystem. Another example would be like wolves and sea stars are other examples of keystone predators that some people might be more familiar with. Um, but simply put, an ecosystem is more resilient and healthier with that keystone species present. So the marine nearshore environment is going to be healthier with having that keystone species in it. Um, the way that sea otters are so important is they help to keep the ecosystem in check by eating, like I said, eating a lot. So as, as they eat a lot, like, like I said, we, we have mussels, clams, abalone, crabs, um, other types of invertebrates. And by, by eating so much, they actually help to naturally regulate the population of those species, particularly sea urchins. And sea urchins are grazers. So when there are too many urchins, they actually eradicate the kelp. And that means, and these sea otters live in these kelp forests. And just like a forest on land, we get these marine forests of kelp and seagrass and otters help promote that by keeping the predation on these grasses and kelp down. But when there are no otters, what can happen is we get places called like an urchin barren. And that's a problem because these kelp forests, like I said, just like a forest on land, create habitat and homes for many other species. And this kelp also helps promote resilient coastlines and is excellent at carbon sequestration. So removing carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, just like forests do. So healthy kelp forests may even play a role in mitigating um, ocean acidification, which is a factor of climate change. And that means that when there, um, as we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, the ocean absorbs it and it actually makes the ocean more acidic. And that makes it difficult for animals that build shells to build their shells. So sea otters can actually help mitigate that um, in, in local areas. So it's ongoing studies, but by having these kelp forests, it can really help with a lot of these climate change impacts that we're seeing. So once again, just to sum that all up, 
sea otter predation allows for these healthy kelp forests which promote biodiversity. And biodiversity is exactly what we need to help us have a more sustainable and resilient future. So this is just another example of how sea otters are, um, have that trophic cascading effect, how they're keystone predators. So in places like California where seagrass habitats are more abundant, that's exactly um, what happens here. Um, like this, this study is actually talking about Elkhorn Slough near Monterey. I think I saw a few, few folks from around, around that area. So you might've even seen sea otters there. And so how this works is in where the absence of sea otters is allowed, shore crabs actually delete, um, deplete populations uh, that clean algae from the seagrass. And then as a conse consequence, the seagrass was unhealthy and numerous organisms that rely on seagrass beds actually died out. But then once sea otters were brought back into the area, the estuary quickly controlled the overgrowth of um, those crabs and everything got back to work cleaning the seagrass and that whole area was able to flourish once again, which creates this habitat for other animals and improves water quality and overall productivity in that Elkhorn Slough area. So like I mentioned before, sea otters were hunted right to the brink of extinction and that had big consequences on the near shore environments. So it had these eco ecological effects. And in some of these instances, that's when a lot of fisheries were developed when the sea otters were gone from these areas. So sometimes because sea otters have been gone from these areas for very long time, sometimes it can actually be difficult to imagine what coastlines would be like today when sea otters return, especially for people who have lived on these coastlines for many, many years, decades even without sea otters. And they've built um, businesses and industries based on an ecosystem that did not have this predator around. So now that sea otters are making a comeback, we that lends itself to human use conflicts with sea otters over resources. But on that other side, sea otters can actually bring in a lot of money through things like tourism. Um, and like I said, they promote a healthy ecosystem, which is critically important. So let's talk briefly about where sea otters live. Um, like I said, I work in the Alaska office. So I'm starting with Alaska first and then we'll work our way down. So Alaska, we have the northern sea otter. We have three populations of sea otters in Alaska. So we have a population out in the Aleutian Islands. That's that red on the, on the map. Then we have the south central population there in the middle and then the southeast population. So the, the red area is actually um, on the endangered species list and that's an area that we are becoming more involved in with our advocacy work. And in our other areas, we are seeing those coexistence challenges with human, um, human resource users as well. So these are all areas that uh, Defenders is engaging in. So like I said, we do have sea otters in Southeast Alaska and the sea otters in this area were were gone because of that fur trade for a long time. But in the 60s, um, about 450 animals were translocated. So they were taken from a different sea otter population and put in Southeast Alaska. And those populations have um, been making a comeback. And they're making a comeback and sea otters tend to stay in kind of one home range before they start expanding into other areas. So not all of Southeast Alaska has sea otters yet, but these sea otters are making a comeback. There are also sea otters in British Columbia. And I'll actually touch on British Columbia a little bit later for some of the really amazing work that is going on there with sea otters and coexistence. And the sea otters that are in British Columbia were also uh, translocated there and have repopulated some of that historical range. There's uh, also northern sea otters down in Washington. Again, they were brought there, uh, translocated, like we just mentioned, 
from Alaska and there are parts of Washington that are reaching their carrying capacity of sea otters, but other parts uh, not quite yet. Moving south a little bit more, there's sea otters in California as well. I'm sure Californians are pretty familiar hearing about sea otters in, in your state. And a, a few dozen sea otters survived in, the sm in a small area along the Big Sur coast. And the current population descends from that group. So the population grew slowly through the 20th century, but the range expansion has stalled from the past 20, 20 or so years. And further expansion beyond where the sea otters currently are um, has been kind of constrained by several factors. And one of which is actually um, shark attacks. Oh, and if I didn't mention it before, it's southern sea otters that are in California. If you're paying attention, you might have noticed I did not mention sea otters in Oregon, and that's because they are not there. Um, they have never been able to make a comeback. It is a bit of a mystery as to exactly why, but there are groups in Oregon working to reintroduce sea otters. Um, chief among those groups is the Alaka Alliance, and I would definitely encourage you all to check them out to learn more about the current lack of sea otters in Oregon and plans to potentially bring them back one day through re reintroduction. Um, that's what this slide talks briefly about. There was a reintroduction attempt in Oregon, um, but it failed and it's still a bit of a mystery as to exactly why. Um, so they, they reintroduced those sea otters, um, but by the 80s, by 1980, all of those sea otters were gone. So the way that Defenders uh, works to protect and conserve sea otters is uh, we do so with sound policy advice. So sea otters are protected both under the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And uh, sea otters are also managed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So the types of work that we need to engage on are mitigating threats that are preventing sea otters from expanding uh, mitigating disturbance, and that can mean a variety of different things from industrial activities all the way down to recreational users who um, maybe just are unaware of how to respectfully recreate around sea otters. Um, advancing coexistence work, uh, supporting the sea otter range expansion, and well, I guess I put advancing coexistence on there twice, so it's doubly important. Now you might remember that I touched on that sea otters eat a lot and that leads to human resource conflicts um, with fisheries. Uh, this is a problem throughout the entire sea otter range and it's a bit of a complicated one, but one that I would, uh, well, something that I'd like to hint at again or touch on again is that these fisheries that are experiencing conflicts with sea otters boomed at a time when the sea otters were nearly extirpated from the near shore environments, but the but these sea otters are keystones and they do promote a healthier ecosystem. And that is an area of study that's getting more and more attention as to exactly what fisheries are in direct conflict with the return of the sea otters and which fisheries might actually receive some benefits from having these healthier um, kelp forests around. So that's a huge area of research that more and more, we're just finding more and more about all the time. But you can just imagine how many fishes that grow and live in the kelp forest environment or in that um, seagrass environment, how those juvenile fish could better prosper in these areas that have these shelters for them. And, you know, once again, those sea otters you might, one could even argue that fisheries as a whole might even benefit because of all those great benefits that sea otters bring through that cascading uh, ecosystem effect. So 
One thing that I'd like to mention is that this summer, Defenders of Wildlife will actually be working with an intern to do a literature review on sea otter fisheries conflicts, management, indigenous approaches, and possible coexistence strategies. And no talk about sea otters is complete without talking about otters and indigenous folk. Um, there are many different peoples along that entire Pacific Rim, but one project that I would just like to touch on briefly and encourage you all to check out is uh, the Coastal Voices Project. That's coastalvoices.net. And this project, it's a diverse group of people discussing and planning for the use of profound changes triggered by the return of sea otters in British Columbia through the lens of traditional knowledge and Western science. Um, they have a fantastic 11 minute video on their website that I could not recommend more. So if you're interested, I highly recommend that you check out their website. So one of the things we mentioned is that sea otters do need to be reintroduced into certain areas, for example, Oregon. Um, there's different ways to do so. Um, in the past, reintroductions have used translocation, um, but we're finding that that might not be the best method. And translocation is where you take sea otters from a healthy population and put them into a new area. Um, there's many downfalls to that, two of which are you need high numbers from that source population and there tends to also be a high mortality rate um, to do re reintroduction that way. The other way is through surrogacy and the way that that works, um, I'll highlight this program from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, is the sea otters are actually uh, reared in their ICU for about eight weeks. And then the sea otters are placed with a female for several months. And then the pups are released at about, about eight to nine months old. And it's actually seen a lot of success because uh, we have evidence that these surrogate raised sea otter pups actually grow to adulthood and reproduce on their own in the wild. So that is definitely one thing that um, we can look forward to in the future. So what you can do, um, you can become sea otter savvy. Uh, there, that is actually its own organization. I'd encourage you to check them out as well. Um, but what that means is uh, there's lots of ways to become sea otter savvy, but one of them is respecting sea otters while recreating. So for those of you who live in a state with sea otters, if you're out kayaking, you're paddle boarding, boating, um, one thing, that, one way that you know you're disturbing sea otters, uh, one, excuse me, one way that you know that you might be disturbing sea otters unintentionally is if the sea otter is lifted, looking its head, looking right at you, that's a sign of disturbance. Um, we don't want to be disturbing sea otters. Like I said, they have to eat a lot. If sea otters are separated from their raft, swim away, they need to rejoin the raft, that takes energy. That might mean that the sea otter now has to eat more and all of that eventually adds up. So just be respectful when recreating. Um, now, another thing that you can do is through individual actions. There's a lot of individual actions you can take to not only help sea otters, but all wildlife. Um, one big thing is avoiding the use of toxic pesticides and fertilizer. You know, Finding Nemo couldn't have said it better that all drains lead to the ocean. So anything that gets into the groundwater or goes down the drain eventually gets to the ocean and fertilizers, pesticides, things like that can have pretty big effects um, as lots of those things get into the sea. Another thing that you can do is avoid your single use plastic use and plastic use in general as much as possible. Um, there are studies that have found um, plastics in sea otter feces. So they are affecting sea otters. Um, you know, there's numbers, a number of reasons to avoid your plastic use as much as possible. Uh, so sea otters can be added to that list as well. Uh, another thing that you can do is just spread the word, you know, tell, tell everybody, you know, how great sea otters are, that they're so good for um, the ecosystem and ways that they can help sea otters. Like I said, avoiding the use of fertilizers, pesticides, and plastic is a great first step. Another thing is uh, you can just stay connected with us, stay connected with Defenders and all the other amazing organizations working to protect and bring back sea otters. And so 
follow us on Facebook, become a member, us, all these other organizations, some of which I've already mentioned. And that will help you stay up to date with actions on when we need to kind of call you into action to help advocate for these sea otters when there's various policy and legislative things going on. Um, so with that, I'm sure you're all ready to get back to painting, but if there's any questions, um, I'm sure we have a few minutes or um, you can feel free to email me or one of our other representatives who work on sea otter issues at any time. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, that was really awesome. And I'm sure that questions are gonna come up. I already see some good chatting going on here. So if you have a question for Katie, why don't you go ahead and send it in the chat and we'll see um, if she can either answer it now or she'll follow up um, later on. So I think we're gonna get back over to Jen and Carrie to continue our paintings here. Thanks Perfect. again, Katie. Yeah, you bet. All right, welcome back, you guys. So we're just going to check our paintings and make sure they're dry. Um, I like to use the back of my hand on the painting to make sure it's dry because typically it doesn't have any paint on it yet. And so I can see clearly if I have any remnants. And then also you're not pushing into the paint with your finger and gouging into the paint if it is still wet. Because those are really hard to get rid of. All right, so we're going to start off with our chalk. If you have colored chalk, that's fine. I got some 99 cent big thing of chalk from um, like Michael's or whatever, and works just fine. I use a sharpener and I sharpen up the tip. I don't know if you can see that. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, and just use one of the bigger ones and it sharpens up nice into a pencil type thing. You can use a pencil. It's kind of hard to see it on the camera if needed. So I use this because it has a nice erase erasability with just a little bit of a wet rag. So we're going to start off with a oval that just had a kid with a square. So <laughs> it's going to be kind of the top of it's going to be touching the top fourth of our PD. And I'm going to tilt mine down. So he's got that cute little cork. So I start off with a line and I'm just rounding out the edges and going a little thicker towards the bottom like that. So oh. you can kind of see the square or the rectangle. Maybe we left out chalk on the supplies list. <laughs> oh, um, maybe, maybe we missed that. Uh, you can also do this with a what? pencil. A pencil. Yeah. Yeah. Pencil's fine. All right. Sorry about that. All right. So we have, it's a, if you look, I have it a little bit thicker at the bottom of my oval square. I have a little bit of extra meat on the side, and then I have a little bit of a rounding on the bottom. So what's great about their chalk is I can go like this, and I can erase. Can they use a Sharpie? You can. And you have to be very brave. So, <laughs> and you, um, you got to stick with your decisions, and that's fine. Like, people, I'm, I'm flaky. I like to change things. So be brave and step forward with your best foot. <laughs> All right, so that's our first portion. We're gonna draw, see the thing is if you, sh you sharpen, you can't use like your midpoint, like these. I'm gonna use midlines to kind of guide where I'm gonna put the rest of the face. And if you use a Sharpie, you kind of gotta go painting over that. So um, you just would wanna paint, you just wouldn't wanna overdraw your lines like you'd want to make sure you get that instead of because overdrawing like that. I don't know if folks can see my screen and I'll put the painting of the sea otter, but if you use Sharpie, it's going to bleed over into this, into the blue area. So that's kind of what she's saying there. Yeah. And then, I mean, you can always go back in and touch it back up, but with paint, with blue paint, with blue paint. All right. So, our next portion is just going to tell us where our eyes go. Okay, we have our circle. Mine's about the size of my hand on the page. So I have a nice, good room at the bottom for my body. Um, but after I have those midlines drawn, I'm just going to draw some lines going like this between the, um, the half of this and the half point of this, connecting those through. I'll let you guys catch up to that point. 
give you a couple minutes, okay? And the, the remind, just a reminder, there will be a recording, so you can rewatch this um, again if your paint isn't dry. All right, folks, hopefully we've caught up to this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these lines to tell us where to not put the eyes any further up, essentially. So I'm going to use this line and divide it in half again and go straight up from there. I'm going to draw a circle. And that's going to be one of my eyes. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side, go straight up. That's going to be another one of my eyes. I just don't want to put it any further up than my diagonal, OK? Go ahead and do some circles. And about how big are those circles, Carrie? Size um, of a penny? On my painting, it's about the size of a penny. Um, but if you want to use it as a guide, um, essentially it's about one fourth the size of this entire space, maybe, if that helps. You can make them bigger until they look correct in the final project. So go smaller rather than too big, essentially. All right, so the next part we're going to do is the nice big cheeks. So this eye is going to be slightly covered by this cheek because he's going to be pushing up with his paw later on. So we're going to cut that off a little bit. We're going to wrap around. And then we're just going to come out to this point right here. And then this eye, you're just going to follow the curve of the eye that you already have and just bring it out to the edge of your already drawn line. Okay. Go ahead and do that. Just going to race underneath so you guys can see. See how this is overlapping on this one? And this one just follows the curve. We, we have a little jingling in the back. We have a couple dogs here, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you can also put in the comment if we're being, if we're going too slow. Um, I'm trying to watch folks on the cameras to see if people are like still drawing and stuff, but you can also drop something in the chat. Can I see the dogs? Uh, yeah. Well, one of them, maybe. Come here, Moose. We've got the ferocious moose. Um, black and white. Should I put it against? 
Very good. Can you see him? Oh, yeah. Can you say hello? Yeah. So that's Moose. Oh, oops. Hey, Moose, you unplugged it. Oh, no. So if you're barking, that's Moose. The other one is downstairs. Um, I can't see her right now, but. <laughs> and we're back. All right. So we got our cheeks drawn in. Next thing we're going to do is a diamond shape. So diamond means taller than it is. We're going to do a diamond that's taller than it is wide, okay? And it's going to be, you don't want it any taller than the eye level. Probably about mid eye level is about where the top of your diamond is going to be. And do that same distance down to the other side. Huh. Yeah. Diamond in nose. I'm going to erase out the middle of my nose so you guys can see what we're doing. And you can do that too, just erase out the chalk from the middle. If you have a pencil and pen, just leave it, it's fine. And if you do have a second or two, um, feel free to drop in the chat. If you have more than one person that is zooming in, uh, it'd be great for us if we can kind of get an idea of how many people are joining. So if you have like three people in the room, just drop in three, including yourself. Um, if you're just the only person, we're just going to count you as one, but we're just trying to kind of see how many people are on. Perfect. Four, three, two, one. Solo creator. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Okay, next step of the nose is we're gonna do little circles in the corners right here. Just little circles, we don't, it, it's about one third the space of this bottom ledge essentially, but noses come in all shapes and sizes. I saw many of them, so. And then you're gonna take your eraser, and you're just gonna go from the inside of it. Oh, I went a little too much, sorry. And you're just gonna erase out that bottom little corner that the circle is touching the nose, like that. So you have two, boop, two little nostrils, and then the nose. Now some of the species have um, a little bit more of a rounded top of the nose, so you can round that out give it a little bit of character. So we'll let you fiddle around with the nose for about five minutes and then we'll come back to it, okay? So.
Sure, kitty cats can count. Nine in Alaska, awesome. Uh, that's at the what's the CUX Center. Oh, we have okay. No chinchillas, a chihuahua. That's the, almost the same size. <laughs> and four cats. Okay, lots of cats and dogs zooming in tonight. <laughs> Okay. All right, so we're going to take the bottom of our nose, which is the bottom of this diamond, and we're connect, going to connect it down to the bottom of our cheeks. So just like a, those basic like dog and cat drawings that you grew, drew as a kid, we're just going to connect that through. And you just can erase this bottom line right through here, making the cheeks nice and full. Awesome. Uh, three chihuahuas, three cats, two medium mutts, all rescues. That's <laughs> awesome. Wow. That sounds like a handful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So how, okay. Sorry. Oh, how would we access the recorded video for later use? Um, so it will be on social media. We also upload all of our videos to Defenders um, website. There's like kind of this whole page that has all the recordings and all the videos that we've done. Um, yeah, so, and we might, I'm not sure if we can send it out. I will do some checking as well. All right, so if you can kind of see where your cheeks kind of touch the edge where it used to be, you're just gonna do a little chin or a half circle across that point. And that's gonna be the bottom part of our chin. Perfect, thanks Monica for dropping that link. And that's where you can access all the previous paint videos and um, actually other, other Zoom meetings and the things that we've done, so. All right, so the next portion that we're gonna do is gonna be our ears. Our ears are kind of these ovals right here, um, here, and then I like to put one for a little bit of character down a little bit further. And then you can just, just only, you can draw just a half circle if you're confident doing that. Um, and then you just kind of round them out and make sure they have nice clear silhouettes. I wouldn't do it much bigger than my thumb, <laughs> but um, you don't want it to be too big because they are kind of little ears. So I guess they're about the same width as the eyes, maybe. Maybe a little bit bigger. All right, the next part we're gonna do is we're gonna do an impression on the cheek where his paw is gonna come up. And I just do like a little, a little, little indent. Coming up, so I like that. All righty, next thing we're going to do is grab from about the point that the cheek touched the edge of the face, and we're going to bring that down 
into making essentially a large oval. So if this was an oval, it would connect up through here like this. Just add a little bit of a curve like that. It's like a Milano cookie. Essentially, yeah. I must be hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't eaten dinner yet. <laughs> then you're going to add just a little bit of neck between the right above the cheek and add a little bit of meat down into your oval on one side. Next one we're gonna do is we're gonna make this paw. It's a nice, long, elongated oval, kind of ellipses the edge of this chin. And I'm gonna put mine about right about there. And I have it slightly at a, at a tilt. Nice, long oval. Does that remind you of a hot dog bun? Yes. <laughs> We're just going to name things after food items. <laughs> We're going to place the hot dog arm underneath. <laughs> so if you can see the edge of that oval kind of went over my chin and pushed up into my face. So we're going to do a V about maybe two inches underneath that. And I'm just going to make it a little exaggerated because we're going to bring the elbow a little bit out past this arm. So, or against the side of the um, body. So this is my V and I'm just going to connect this down to my V and get rid of the extra. So just do your V and out nice and big and then connect it down so it looks like this is naturally flowing into this. Okay. So my V. Nobody said we're going too fast, so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep moving along. <laughs> Probably because those that are trying to catch up can't reach for the chat. <laughs> oh. <Fair enough. laughs> so we're going to connect this V on the outside and just kind of wrap it into the body like that. So I took this and I just curved it around this way and I just erased that part of the V that was outside of that range. I'm just gonna highlight to you guys where the paw actually is by going a little bit deeper and thicker. You can erase this portion of your paw if you have an erasable medium. You don't have to though, you can paint over it, it's fine. I just want you guys to be able to see the silhouette of what we're dealing with. Okay. So this paw is a little trickier. I know the other one was hard enough, Carrie. Why are we doing even a trickier one? That's okay, because it looks cute. That's why we're doing it. <laughs> so my edge of my chin is right here. I'm going to tuck this paw slightly under it. So you're gonna see me draw over it. I'm just gonna keep my order of lines. And I'm gonna do a, a rectangle that's slightly tilted up. So this is my chin. So I'm gonna erase over the top so it tucks this rectangle underneath. 
If you're dealing with an unraceable medium, you can just make this line thicker so you know when you're painting, you're painting this portion over top of this portion. All right, now that we have our rectangle here, um, we're going to do a circle that ends about the same point that this comes down. So we're not going to surpass this line, but we're going to do a circle about that size so that we know the edge of this, but not any longer than our box already is. And that's just going to give us the wrist. It's going to give us his wrist. So we're using this radius right here to form the wrist of, so you don't have to have this whole portion down here. It's just to help us know how much of a the wrist um, circumference to do essentially. It just gives us that cute little tuck. So I'm gonna go, I'd say about one fourth down from this point. I'm going to draw a line going out like that. And so just so you guys can see clearly what we're using for the wrist is we're using this portion like this to form that radius. So this uh, session is supposed to end at eight. So we're hoping that we can finish the saw at by eight. Uh, we might run over and if you have to jump off that's totally fine um once again we can you'll just be able to watch this session it's going to be like a youtube video so you can like fast forward to the part that you need to watch um so we're shooting for an end time of 8 p.m alaska time um but we might run a little bit over all right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use the general motion of the top of this ring rectangular rectangle. Wow, that's what happens. <laughs> we're going to come down no and just come down a little bit, um, not quite all the way to the edge of um, your otter, because that's just going to be the crease kind of where your elbow is on him. Just bring that down. Is that all in frame? Can they see mm -hmm. that? Okay. Oh, I know you said that was a little low. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Cool. All righty. So we're going to take, we're going to bump this, this elbow comes out a little bit because it's hanging over the body. And you're just going to add a little bit going up and just connect it into the top portion and just make a nice gradual curve. So this was where my body was. I'm just going to create a nice little elbow, make it look naturally flowing into the arm. Like that. So he has a little bit of fuzzies hanging over. I'm just trying to see here if people are still trying. Yeah, I think probably people can catch up. Yeah, it's like a few people are done. But. Still here. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Is this the fun part, Carrie? Huh? Is this the fun part? The fun part it? for me is the fuzzies. Oh, I, the fuzzies. I, I love adding the fluffies with the with the brushes. That's my favorite part. Um, Actually, whiskers. Never mind. I lied. I'm sorry. Whiskers are my favorite part. Whiskers are the fun part. Go, shoo, shoo. That's my favorite part of this one. All right. Sounds good.
So we're gonna do just the basics inside the mouth with the chalk, um, the teeth and that type of stuff. It's easier to do that with the paint. Um, so we're just gonna do the bottom lip and the top of the tongue. So the bottom lip, we wanna go, let's see. We wanna go from about, I would say, I, I would leave like, about the width of my finger in the chin portion. This is all gonna be fuzzy. So um, this is gonna be essentially where his lip is. That's gonna be in like a dark gray. The bottom of his lip? Mm -hmm. okay. but yes, sorry, the bottom of his lip. And then his tongue, we're gonna to put chalk for the back of his tongue because we're gonna paint back inside the back of his mouth, like down in there, we're gonna paint that. So. This is all like when you're kind of dealing with the big fat chalk thing, it's hard to draw in the details. So, but there is a close up of how to do the mouth. If you're doing pencil and such, you could <laughs> go far into detail in this portion. We're gonna leave that towards the end when we're filling it in with a uh, marker. So, okay guys, you got through the chalking in and laying out of lines. And I'm just gonna go over a technique with you real quick. So when we're painting, we don't want to paint over our chalk lines. So this is a completely like dry brush, um, just to show you guys. So I'm gonna say I had paint on this brush. I wanted to push it up to this line. I can do it in small gliding motions down up to a line. I guess down up to a line. I know that not make sense, but I want to paint towards a line like this. I don't want to be going like this because then I'm going to erase my lines and I'm going to lose my piece. If you're doing with a pencil or something, that's going to be easier. But um, we want to be able to see the majority of our lines. Like you can get rid of this one and our midpoint. That's fine to get rid of. All these ones, that's fine. But like where our eye is, we don't want to accidentally go like that and completely lose it. So no pirate otters. And no pirate otters. Okay. So it's a let's see. Am I, does it focus on my hand? Uh, yes. It does. I wonder if I okay. So I would push into the line kind of like that rather than like this towards the line. I push towards it. That makes sense. So stay within the lines. Yeah, stay within your lines. <laughs> it's not the end of the world if you don't, but it's gonna help you out in the long run. And what we're gonna do is once everything's painted and dried, we're still gonna be able to see those chalk lines, but we're gonna erase them out of the paint and then you'll see blue and then you can cover the blue with a black line. Don't do that. I'm, I can do that because I'm, I'm experienced. But <laughs> anyway, so. That's essentially where we're cheating the system is essentially we're painting within our lines with such exactness that when I when you erase out the chalk, you can just go over it with the black Sharpie and then you're set and you're good. Anyway, okay. Now that we've got that technique over, go ahead and put onto your palette tan and your brown, or you can mix together white and brown to get a, a chunk of tan. Um, we're going to start by working in layers from the back towards the front. That way our layers can dry in between each setting. Uh, what about the left hand? The left hand. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, you're right. It's, you can kind of round it out, I apologize. Oh. <laughs> it's got like a box. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. You just round out the corners. I guess I just, I do that in my head, I apologize. <laughs> so yeah, you can just, you round out the corner ever so slightly. The bottom one gets rounded out even more. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> and then you just erase the box and you should be good. That's our little paw, okay? Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start off. This is my, I guess this is my large brush. I guess it's about an inch in that or in size. And I'm loaded up with my tan, tan paint, and I'm going to be painting the background 
back behind the eyes, okay? So this is that pushing method. When I get really close to a line, I'm just gonna push into it instead of painting over my lines. And you just wiggle the brush. So we're going to be doing multiple layers of the tan and other colors um, because you can see still blue through that tan. So the reason we're painting it in sections is so that this layer can dry. We'll paint this layer, then we can go back to this layer and build up those dry layers. Okay. So go ahead and paint back behind the eyes with your paintbrush. Okay. And you can give it a little fluffy too, if you'd like. Just little fluffs hanging out the top. I'm just wiggling my brush from side to side, going up and down with the flap to do that. So now he has his military haircut. Yes. <laughs> fluffy. fluffy on top, straight on the side. So. Yeah, thanks for joining us. I know some of you are East Coast time and it's quite a bit later. Yeah. Um, sure. But yeah, look for the the Zoom, uh, not the Zoom link, the video link. All right, so he should be a little bit fluffy. Okay, and now we're going to move on to painting the cheeks with that same tan color, um, avoiding the eyes, the nose, and just painting up to the edge of the cheeks here. Once you've accomplished that. Uh, what color is the top of the head, white or tan? Tan. Is there all tan? This is all tan going down first because we're trying to block out that blue. It does look white in the screen. It doesn't. It? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's quite this, light. It's the zoom that yeah. makes it look white. <laughs> so I'm using tan right now. I guess you could do white it. if you wanted an albino or Seattle. Hey, hey <laughs> do they have those? I'm sure there is, but maybe some, we have somewhere, some yeah. that'd be cool. Or the acoustic one. <laughs> this is the fun, relaxing part. Just painting around the lines that you already drew out. The non-stressful part where it's just like, just paint the background brown. There you go. <laughs> Got all the hard stuff out of the way with drawing all our lines beforehand. So now we can just relax and paint. I'm going to use my smaller brush to paint inside the nostrils because I just don't think I could fit my one inch brush in there to paint them white. And just keep in mind the smaller the brush. Uh, I've shown the up close, like all nostril yeah. thing. And like eat camera. Yeah. I always feel like when you pull that out, it's kind of like in a cooking show when they pull out like the already <laughs> baked thing from Here's the inside the oven, and it's like, hey, it's <laughs> <Just> cheating. <laughs> this is what I painted. <laughs> 
Not really, though. <laughs> All right. Okay. So by this time, the top portion that you painted at the beginning should be dry, and you can go back over it and get rid of more of that blue. Okay. Pretty children. Someone's bit. Here it looks so good, it's just so with fluffy. a little bit of color. Oops, that one went a little high. It's okay. He has a mohawk. <laughs> All right, and this is dry for me now, so I'm gonna relayer <laughs> this um, this portion of their face with tan. <laughs> Get it nice and thick. I don't want to see none of that blue. And you can also paint underneath your lip. So this one represents the thickness of my lip. So I'm just going to paint underneath that a layer of tan to begin with. So actually, I need my small brush. He's little. He's just the little one. Just going to get that first layer of tan down on underneath that lip. Make it nice and fluffy. A fluffy, fluffy. It's my hair covering everything. Good. Um, no. Cool. You can see your just a side, side profile from the full painting. So cool. <clears throat>
All right, next portion we're gonna do is we're gonna paint our little ears with our dark brown that we have. And it's okay if you bleed into this part of the fur, you can cover it up, um, painting the other direction here in a little bit. We're just getting that base layer down of the dark brown. When I was doing the research for the uh, which painting, what uh, photographs to use, it was so hard to pick between all the cute little otters. Like the way that they just carry around a favorite stone, it's so adorable. <laughs> it cracks the clams just right. And I'm just rinsing out my large brush that I use to paint this area so that I can do the dark brown on the bottom part of the body without tainting it with my light tan that I have. So rinse it out nice and good. If you have a different paintbrush that can work, that works too. Good. Okay, we'll take our dark brown. We're going to do the same thing that we did on the face, avoid our white lines, and we're just going to paint the whole body that is here dark brown, and then we'll get out some black and work with some black here in just a little bit. But it's going to take you a second to build up the brown. So when I am painting this portion of the body, what I'm thinking of is the fur kind of goes down like this as it shifts down the body. So I'm going to paint really fluffy because their fur is actually quite long right through here. I'm going to paint kind of fluffy through that way. And I'm going to shore it up and make it a little bit shorter when I come back. like that. And then the fur comes out of the arm, kind of like this, circles around. I'm just going to paint using my paintbrush to kind of shape the arm and make it feel round. If you've ever messed with like a really hairy guy's arm and like lotion or something, and if you do the lotion in the shape of his arm, we're kind of painting in that same direction. So just use that hairy arm guy to like guide you in this otter. It'll be your spirit animal for your otter essentially. Okay. We're just gonna go down like this. <laughs> I know now everyone's mad. Very, very, very relatable, Carrie. Well, you know. I did my watercolor, so I'm done. Oh, oh nice. But I, I love this format of painting and education. Thanks for joining. Cool. Yeah, watercolor. Watercolor takes a different level of skill because you 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 can't mess up like <laughs> you can with <laughs> acrylic and oil because you can't cover it up as well. You got to scratch off the paper. So yeah. hat off to you for doing that that whole thing. Watercolor. And watercolor. So I'm just closing up my gap on my arm. Um, so it'll be just a little bit thinner. I made it nice and thick so you guys could see the gesture of the arm. We're just gonna boop. Make it a little bit smaller. Oops, this. Terry, take your own advice, push up from the sides. Yeah, good job. <laughs> <laughs> You just get enthusiastic and you just keep going and then you're like, oh shoot, painting in the wrong direction. The 
clear with this forgiving them. And because I'm right-handed, I work typically from this uh, left side out this way, so my hand's not touching wet paint. You saw earlier I got white paint all over my hand when I was doing the background because I didn't do left to right, so creature or habit. But probably if you're doing left-handed, you might even start from this way going, from the right going to the left. I don't know, I've never been left handed. Those people that are ambidextrous, just always oh, just amaze me because they just can do everything, doesn't matter. They'd be a real surprise in a fight. I feel like there's a Princess Bride quote, right? I'm not like, oh, I'm, oh, how's that go? It's like, oh, I trained left handed. But I'm actually right handed, and then they switch and then they go boom and they're real fighting. That's pretty cool. I'm sure someone knows the Princess Bride quote that I'm talking about. Oh, I missed it. What'd you say? Uh, you know when. Uh, oh God, the man in the black mask is fighting oh. Inigo Montoya and he's like, oh, I'm left, I, oh, I'm, I'm actually right-handed or something <laughs> yeah. like that. And he switches. And he switches. Hands. And I was like. Oh yeah, Princess Bread. <laughs> yeah. But like, what's the line? It goes like, um, you know, I have, I have a surprise for you too or something like that. Oh, there we go. I'm not left-handed. And he switches. Yeah. <laughs> Something I ought to tell you, I'm not left-handed either. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if, if I was a uh, ambidextrous, I would be quoting that all the time. <laughs> so much, so much. And on this same arm, we're going to do the hairy man arm trick. Um, the hair kind of goes like this, and then it comes down like this off the arm. So we're just going to use the hairy man trick to <laughs> guide us through. Oh, yeah. Someone's like, am I the only one that's left-handed? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. I wonder how many left-handed left people we have on online. I actually saw a really cool TED talk about left-handed and like why there's not as many because like you would lose your edge as being left-handed essentially if there was more left-handed people it would lose the reason why it's a, like essentially the reason left-handed people exist is because it's a an advantage over right-handed people but if there was more left-handed people then that they would, would lose be. that advantage and so it it like works its way out of the oh we have another lefty <laughs> oh, there we go yay two people out of 67. Woo -woo. <clears throat> i was in a class actually one time and i had six people out of a 10 person class that were left-handed oh another person who's left-handed there we go we're taking off the world watch out <laughs> <laughs> one here Oh, it's focusing on your hair. Oh. <sighs> you have to buzz your head. First world problems. Yeah, first world problems. <laughs> when Zoom can't auto, auto focus on <laughs> the right thing. And don't forget this little triangle square to paint that dark brown as well. 
<clears throat> I'm a lefty. I'm a lefty. Oh. Oh, we have lots of lefties. Five, six, six left-handed people. <laughs> wow. I wonder if left-handed people are inherently more creative. I wonder if there's something wrong. Okay. It's like one of those science projects. So I have my whole background filled in with lots of little fluffies and such to some degree or another. So I just, I'm going back through and if I see blue, I'm covering it back up. So go ahead and do that on your own work. And hopefully we're not leaving anyone in the dust completely. Maybe everyone's beating. Let me see if I can scroll through and see. No, it looks like everybody's still painting. Good. From what I can see, there's a couple who might be done. I don't like to be in last place. Okay. All right. Hopefully everyone's got their base layer painted down of brown. Next thing we're going to do is we're just going to take a tiny bit of black. So mine's ivory black, but any decent good black will work for you. And we're going to make a wash out of it. And so what that means is we're going to add a little bit more water than we would typically would to painting it. We're just gonna make it super runny. Let me see if I can get it. Oh, it's kind of dripping off the brush. And we're gonna go over our shadow areas. So that's gonna be down in this hole, okay? So that's nice and dark, okay? And we're going to bring it out to underneath the paw. Okay, it's going to go down the side of the arm. And underneath the elbow. Kind of like that. And then what you can do if you're seeing a lot of brush marks like this is you can just kind of tap at it and then repaint over it. If it's like drippy or anything. Because that's where I first started, so it was a little drippy. So I'm just gonna blend it into that dark brown back behind it. And if your background is completely dry, you can add a little bit of your dark brown and mix it in with the in with the black kind of like on the canvas and bring it and just kind of gradually fade it into your 
background brown. But this whole area underneath is going to have that dark brown, dark brown with the gouache of black, essentially. Actually, I'm going to use my bigger brush. Use the big brush. Now that we're not doing the details. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of paint this whole underneath area with that darker wash of dark black. Because it's the farthest, darkest thing on the page, on the fur. And if you're removing a lot of your brown and you're starting to see blue again, you might have too much water in your wash and you might be scrubbing too much. So you just add a little bit of brown maybe into the mix to thicken up that black paint that you turned into your gouache. That way it's a little bit lighter, but still doing some good coverage. I'm getting too old for my knees. <laughs> okay. And then I'm also going to do the top here with a little bit of the darker brown color, just, just down into the crease, just a little bit, and kind of fades up with my wash, kind of like that. And do the same thing on this. Just a little bit of the gray. I'm sorry, not the dark brown wash. Dark black or light black? They make it light black. Yeah. So it's the brown black wash right here. It's tough and forget my words. <clears throat> it's also the end of the day. Yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to work with this bottom portion of the um, arm and I'm going to just kind of make it go some fluffies, kind of blend it into the bottom. I still can see where the end of my arm is in some areas, but I'm just kind of kind of blend it ever so slightly in and over the top. But I want to be able to, when I go back with my marker, um, kind of highlight that this spurs coming from this arm and coming down. Maybe I'll show them up, up close yeah. of what it looks like finished so you can kind of get an idea of what she's talking about. Ooh, there we go. So I'm painting on this arm, pulling it down with the dark brown over this fur so you can see that it's going on top of this layer. Too much wash. Too much wash. There we go. A little too wet. That's okay. All right. So my area here is a little wet. I don't know about you guys. So I'm gonna need to move on to a different area real quick. So we're gonna work on the ears for me. And if you guys agree we'll go over there all right so i'm going to take a little bit of my black and a little bit more of my brown and just mix it plug it about that darkness on my brush and i'm just gonna Go underneath. Should I 
the ear. Is this where she's zoom in? Close up for it here? Probably. Sorry. Well, we'll be moving the camera a little bit so that y'all can see up close. Oh, not my hand. So I'm going to just be going underneath, making a line with my brush and just fading that it's going to be a little bit darker in the corner and then it goes to a thinner area right through there. I'm going to stop at that point and add more, um, more of my light, lighter brown to it and just kind of blend it together on the canvas so it's a nice light gradient. Let you guys do that with both ears. Go ahead. And it's kind of hard to paint sideways. <laughs> <laughs> so the camera can see. Yeah, kind of like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. More up close or? Mm -hmm. No, I'm going to do the nose and the eyes, I think. So, we'll be. Well, okay, nose and eyes, yeah. Okay, so now we're going to work on the nose and the eyes. We use our darkest black on the eyes. So, you want to make sure your brush is really clean out, make sure it's all good. Just gonna, we're going to just do, we're going to paint up to our cheek lines, but the rest of it's pretty much just a round circle of black. It's pretty simple line, nothing too fancy. Nice and round. And this is where you can kind of step back from your painting, see if you need to make them a little bit a little bit bigger because hopefully you start off small. Okay, okay. and then we're going to paint in the nose black as well. Have a very beady eyed. I love it. Well, you can always make it a little bit bigger if needed. Beady eyed uh, on it. Well, I mean, he's suspicious. They must sell day, right? Mm -hmm. Weasley eyes. <laughs> Oops. Sorry, I'm moving the camera a little. <laughs> we can paint that out. Okay, and just paint that all in black. And then you're gonna add a little bit of a lighter gray, just on the out, outer edge like that. Just give it a little bit of reflection. Just a little bit of white. Thank you. Oop, that might have been too much white. Yes. Yeah. Cool beans. There's the molds. And I'm going to clean up the edges of my nose with my marker. You'll probably be a good idea to do the same. And with that same brush, you can take 
your dark, um, your black and your white and make a dark, dark gray color. So let's see, let's do my colors. That dark gray color is going to go back inside the mouth. And then and it's going to go down to where the tongue is. Just the inside of the mouth. Oops. I should fix that. I was painting sideways. And you don't need to connect these two. I apologize. I just. Painting sideways is not the easiest thing to do. Okay. That's the nice thing about acrylics. Yeah, they're pretty forgiving. Yeah. It doesn't look you can good. paint paint yeah. over it. Yeah. Too light, paint over it. Too dark, paint Too over good. it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just covering up a little bit more of my blue. I'm just covering up my mistake over here. Okay. Right. Okay, okay. So we're going to take that same gray color that we had back in here. We're going to add a little bit more white to it. We're going to paint that lip. So that lip is just right from this point now to this point, the dark gray. Okay. Then take a little bit of our red, okay? Put it over next to our white. And we're gonna paint the tongue pink for so we're going to mix white with our red, get a nice pink going. This is kind of bogus. <laughs> kind of sort of. Not really. <laughs> All right. But everybody knows what pink looks like. So. Right. Okay. Take the tongue pink. And you're going to go all the way up to the lip because that's going to also be your gums because their gums are pink as well. Uh, she mixed red and white. Red and white together to get the pink. <clears throat> should should have been. Oh, let me see. What's the flyless going out with it? I'm trying to think. Oh, sorry. I, I wonder what happened with our supply list. Yeah, sounds like one went out. Hmm. Sorry about that. If you didn't see that red was on there, maybe that. I think it must have gotten left off. Yeah. Um, white for it. So, what? Can you say that again? What color do you think would be best? Like a white tan mix? Um, if you don't have red. You could do, I think a gray blue would be better because their tongues mm -hmm. could, you know, because uh, tongues mm -hmm. can sometimes be a blue gray color. Red was the playlist that I looked at. Okay, so I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, you can you can do the purple, a little bit of a. Would you say blue and? Yeah, blue a blue gray tongue. Blue gray tongue also works. Um, when you can you can also always go back over it. Yeah, you red. can go back in. Yeah. Um, you're not painting so, over the top of it. Yeah. So, yep. Okay. Fill it in. So we are going to make 
little banana shapes in the corners of the mouth, you know, like runts, like the candy. We're just gonna chop those runts in half. And those are gonna be our canines. Um, you're gonna define them more with the Sharpie later, but it's gonna, not gonna go over the top of that lip and you're not gonna go over your grayness. And you're gonna take those two runts and you're just gonna put them in the corners like that. Um, and we do like we're doing a time check real quick. We do know it's eight o'clock. Yeah, sorry. Um, talk about a little long. <laughs> but <laughs> it's okay. Like we are doing a recording. You can if you have to jump off right at eight. We understand. Um, but stick with us a little bit longer if you can, and we'll try to try to okay. finish it up. So the little canines and uh, sorry, the little teeth in the middle. There's four of them, and they just kind of are little blobs. Three and four, like that. Okay. And all righty. So, so now we're just going to add some texture and color to the face. This is the fluffy part that I was saying that's really fun for me. And you're going to take your brown in your can. And you're just going to kind of put yeah. it kind of everywhere. Slide your head over. Oh, dang it. Oops, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And then once you, so you lay down that color, and then you take your brush. Oh, sorry. Uh, people want to zoom in on the teeth. Oh, sorry. Oh, shoot. Dang it. <laughs> Cut the lights, Terry. <laughs> okay. So we'll just do a little bit of zoom in. And then this is like the, I'm not done with that, but yeah. <laughs> so you put a little bit of the darker brown on top and then you dry brush over it and it kind of gives it a little bit of texture and leaves a little bit of that tan, uh, the uh, darker brown behind. You just kind so of mixing this in here, mixing down here some together, and then I'm just adding it kind of with my brush randomly because every one, every otter has different patterns, so you are more than able to create your own version of how dark or how light something is. Pretty great. You just kind of add that layer on top and just dry brush until you like the color that it's at. Like I like a little bit lighter around the eyes. I think it looks cuter. And just kind of work between the colors back and forth. Give it some dry brush texture on top like that. It's really interesting because some of them were pretty much all just basic tan and then some of them had like a lot darker complexions. I wasn't sure if that was like between like like female and male or if that was like a regionary or region yeah. color yeah. region colors like or something. Diet like could claim to yeah. for darkness or lightness. Yeah. Be, I don't know. Wait, Gary, Katie, what was your question? Oh, so some of the sea otters were, they varied in color, and we were just wondering if the variance of color could be regional thing or, or diet. Like male yeah. or it's more, it's northern versus southern. The northern ones are uh, darker typically and have a darker face, and the southern ones are the ones with the lighter faces. Oh, so these are like the California sea otters. Yep. The bleach blonde surfer hair. Yeah. yeah. Beach hair. <laughs> Yeah, yeah exactly. all the sun that they get in California. <laughs> oh yeah, that might actually, <laughs> that might be reason. Yeah. We're going to increase those too. Okay. So I'm also going to add a little bit of my brown and we're just going to lightly brush on the cheeks. Ooh, that's a little dark. And make, make some texture on the cheeks. I just want to 
show that the fur is not all lying in the same direction, just they have just a little bit of extra color on their cheeks, of a little darker. It kind of splotches throughout. It's not super consistent in any way that I could detect. Just kind of, just kind of goes everywhere. The darker areas, I might have been food. I don't know. <laughs> so, what do you mean by telling me? You know, wipe off their little mustaches. Oh, there you're not using that thing. Actually, I would believe out of all of them, if otters use a napkin, I would believe it of otters. Because <laughs> I mean, they use a tool like a rock. That's, I mean, that was so cool. Break open there. Maybe they use the kelp to wipe their faces. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, the photos of the otters like hanging out in the kelp. Just <laughs> like all as a family, just chilling out. <laughs> it's so cute. Couldn't help it. I'm just going to add that same color to my chin as well, guys. I want to dry brush in some color like I did on the face. I'm going to do that to the chin as well. Okay. okay. Let you guys do that for a second. Catch up to my point. All right, the next point you're going to do is take the smallest brush you have and we're going to put the highlights in the eyes. So it's going to be, I like to make, um, to make my brush smaller essentially as I take a drop of paint and you see how it's kind of dripping off. I'll use the very, very tip of that drop of paint, tiny, tiny bit, barely touching it. So barely touch it and that just leaves the, just the tiniest little dot. Okay, and we're gonna use that concept and I can do it again for you. Use that concept and we're gonna drop it onto the eye. We're just gonna boop ever so tiny. It takes a little, just a little bit of paint. So we're gonna do it in the top, I guess nine o'clock position. On both eyes. Not super faint, but it's super I faint. Like it. And you can make it a little bit bigger, like you can make it into a rectangle if you want. You can add a couple in a row. So it just gives him the glint of life. Yep, the glint of life is now <laughs> restored into your into your uh, otter. So the next part is the probably the simplest part is you're gonna wait for it to dry completely. Air blow dry it, whatever it takes. And then you're gonna take a wet, wet cloth and you're gonna go over those points that you have the chalk and it leaves that little bit of extra turquoise. And I'm gonna go over that with my marker. If they have pencil, do you suggest they erase it or just leave it? Pencil? Yeah, if they had drawn um, pencil. No, they can just, they can just uh, draw on top of it, that's fine. Okay. Um, as long as you're covering up your marks with that. And then after you've drawn all your black lines, you can go in and touch up the turquoise that you maybe didn't cover or something like that. So like, I was a little light on that point, so I'm just gonna fill up the line. Kind of like that. You just fill in all the extra details. So that's that portion. So I'm just going to move on to the whiskers really quick so that people that need to leave can leave. Um, I'm going to take my extra fine brush. So that is like two or three, two or three hairs. It's, it's tiny. It's really 
it's not very big. And you can cut up an old brush if you don't have a brush that's tiny and just leave a couple. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna work in a pattern like a grid. So one dot's there. If one dot's here and here, I'm gonna work from there, okay? But I'm gonna work down, they kind of curve down towards the face. On the, like that. And you're just gonna build them up. So there's one right there. So I'm gonna put one in between those and move down, down like that, okay? So that's how you do the whiskers is you go in between and you just, and you just build up like five or six layers of them. And boop, some of them go out a little bit more. All right, so that's how you do that. And you'd wanna do the whiskers last so they lay on top of your black line, okay? I'm gonna to have to redo the whiskers because I went over an area that wasn't finished, okay? So I'm, you guys can stick with me as we continue and finish, but um, you got the basic gist of going over your lines and adding little scruffs and such. <laughs> Someone's like, uh, they had a blast. My otter did not come out as good as my wolf. Mine needs a dentist and a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> teeth are hard. I, I was, a little hesitant to do teeth, but it was so cute with teeth. I couldn't, couldn't help it. Yeah. Braces can also be your marker. See how that cleans that up real nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining us, everyone. If you have to jump off, we understand we're a little past the hour. I'll just follow along as I go around with my pen, if you'd like. I'll move this so I end up with stuff in my painted arms. This pen does not do great sideways. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I didn't think about that. What kind of pen are you using? Sorry. So this is a Sharpie oil-based pen. Um, you can also just use the permanent marker pens because those are actually oil-based too. Um, this is just a paint pen. It does best when it's pressed down like this. I'm using it on mail. Oh, sorry. When it's, how is it best used? Best use pushing down. So like, oh, if our uh, canvas was flat. If my canvas is flat on the ground, it like uses paper. ink. It flows down the pen, down to the nub like this. But I'm using it sideways, so it's a little dry. But it's great for when you are, are using flat. it correctly. <laughs> Add a little hair, hair, little hair fluffies, yeah. I'm just zigzagging my my pen kind of everywhere. Just letting it do its thing. Let it get it going. That just erased the chalk for me, so now I can go in with my pen.
go around, touch up all my empty spaces, because you can't predict exactly where all your empty spaces are going to be. Give him some texture on its lip. Color on his nose. I know it really cleans up the nose. <laughs> yeah, it really does help. But my knees are really And like Carrie said before, if you do have blue, like a little bit of blue showing through, you can always just go over it with another color. So with the brown. Always touching that. That's fine. Okay. We'll give you guys a little bit of time to touch up like me. Okay. Oh, something else they have that's really cute is when you're doing your whiskers, they kind of have little offshoots of white coming, like almost eyebrows. That's what I thought. It's like two or three maybe pops coming up from their eyebrow area. Almost like whiskers for the eyes. <laughs> But, you know, some of them have convergent evolution, like walruses have very similar uh, whiskers. whiskers. Yeah, it's just kind of fun. Very similar, so. That was a big one. That's true. <laughs> Brown whiskers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I actually did this, but. <laughs> okay. That'll be all right. We'll put this back on. So we got the whiskers, the eyes, the nose. Clean up. You can clean up a lot using your paintbrush, like the nose, like. Didn't quite get it all nailed in. And Monica will put the 
the link to the place where we post all our videos again. And I think we'll let her wrap it up because we're done on our side. Yep, sounds good. Wow, thank you so much, you guys. It is so cute. I hope that everybody's are looking good. I think that mine needs a little bit more drying to finish it up, but here we are. <laughs> I'd love to see everybody. So I'm gonna um, unspotlight Jen and Carrie so we can all share our beautiful works of art. If your computer has an, um, oh wait, here we go. If your computer doesn't jump back to gallery view, if you go to the top right corner of the um, screen, you'll see a little view button and you can hit that and click gallery and then we can check everybody's out. Let's see. Um, Cool. I'm going to take a little group photo if everybody can keep holding them up for a second. <laughs> they look awesome. Okay, one, two, three. All right, I've got a couple. Those are so cute. Um, if, if anybody is feeling particularly confident or just thinks that their otter is very cute, um, we would love if you could send us a photo of just yours, too. Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat so you can email it to me if you have a chance. Um, and give me just a second. I'm going to put in our events link one more time so that you all can revisit this video. It should be up. Hopefully, we can get it up there tomorrow, but for sure by early. We'll get it up there tomorrow so that people can finish their painting over the weekend. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. It was really awesome to have you all here, to see you all painting, to paint with you. Um, if you have a second, we would love it if you could take this short little survey to let us know what you thought. Um, and let's give a quick little round of applause, well, virtual round of applause to Carrie. She did such an awesome job. Um, if you want, you can use your little reaction feature. You can use your little clap hands or you can use your real hands. <laughs> Either way. Um, and a huge thank you to Jen for um, keeping us all on track, chatting with us. Thank you so much to Katie for your chat, for your talk, teaching us all about sea otters. Um, so please be in touch. Uh, you're welcome to stay tuned for more Defenders events on our Facebook page, through our listserv emails. Um, and I hope you all have a fabulous rest of your night. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs>